What's up everybody? Thank you so much for clicking on this video. We are back again today with another fantasy football video. It is officially Thursday, August 25th. It is fantasy football draft season. From now until the kickoff of the NFL season, all of you will probably be running your fantasy football drafts with your friends or your family or coworkers or maybe just random people. Who knows? And in today's video, I'm going to provide some tips that will not only help you maybe during the draft, but during the season as well to help you bring home that championship, bring home the bragging rights, maybe even earn a little bit of money. Now, I like to think of these a little bit as kind of next level tips, maybe some ideas that you had never thought about before, and they may seem extremely minor, but they could give you that slight edge that can help you win your fantasy football leagues in 2022, especially for those of you that are in highly, highly competitive leagues where everyone's good. So let's just get right into it. And without further ado, here are the tips that I have for you in this video. The first tip I have for you guys today is to maximize your IR spots. Now, just a side note for any of you that are in leagues where there are no IR spots, you need to go to your commissioner, you need to go to the other players in your league, bring this to a vote, or however you guys make rule changes, you need to try to get this changed in your league if you don't have IR spots, because they're extremely, extremely important, extremely valuable, especially since the NFL changed the rule. For those of you that don't know, I forget exactly when it was, but when you were put on IR, you were done for the year. Then the NFL changed it to where... You can bring one player back in, I think, eight or 10 or 12 weeks or something. And now it is currently, I think, uh, uh, four, a four-week stint that you must be – you must miss four games if you're going to be put on IR, but after that you can come back. And the NFL, it's a brutal sport. So go to your commissioners. Go to, go to the other players in your league. Try to get this changed. Now, for those of you that do have IR spots in your leagues already, you need to maximize these spots. Too many times in the leagues I'm in, I see people not using their IR spots, and I don't understand why they aren't doing it. What I mean by maximizing them is, is kind of use them as extra bench pieces. Don't just use them, uh, or don't just wait until one of your players gets hurt to put, put them on IR. Don't use them like that. Pick players up off of waivers or at the end of drafts and put them on your IR and just pick up someone else that you were already going to pick up. Almost always in my drafts near the last round or two, I'm always looking for that player that's going to be on IR to start the season or on the PUP if, if your league allows PUP players to be IR eligible uh, to start the season, and I draft them. And as soon as the draft's done, I put them on IR, and then I pick up another player that I was looking at drafting because – more than likely, they're going to make it to waivers. And you should kind of be doing the same thing throughout the whole season. Every week during uh, the, the waiver run, when you're, you're planning on dropping someone, maybe um, picking someone else up, maybe pick up an IR guy, throw him on your IR, and then pick up the other guy that you're planning on, on uh, picking up already. You know, again, maximize the IR spot. It, it could pay off in the future. A, a big counter argument I hear to this is, you know, well, when I activate this player, I'm going to have to drop someone on my roster and I like all the guys I drafted and or I like all the guys currently on my team. And I just tell people it's football. It's fantasy football. You have no idea what your team's going to look like in three or four weeks. So much changes in the NFL over the course of a three of three weeks. Players get hurt. Players start slumping. Players don't look as good as they uh, as you thought they were going to be. Whatever. Things change and you can make that decision when it comes time to make that decision. And if you do have to just drop the IR guy after he, he gets activated from, from the IR, well, that's fine. It didn't cost you anything. He was just sitting on your IR anyway. So why not use it? Why not maximize it? Who knows? So some players I'm looking at this year, just that come off the top of my head, we have you know Michael Gallup for the Cowboys is probably going to start the season on, on the PUP or on the IR. Um, maybe someone like Gus Edwards is going to start the season on the pup or the IR, you know, Jamison Williams is going to miss some time for the Detroit lions. So why not grab him near the end of the drafts? If he's there, throw him on your IR, all these players, if you think about it, all these players, if they were healthy, they'd be getting drafted much higher. Michael Gallup, who knows, you know, he might be going in the seventh, eighth, ninth round of your drafts, right? Wide receiver two for the Cowboys, potentially, uh, Gus Edwards on, on, uh, you know, kind of the running back two on a, on a team that runs the ball well and likes to run, 
he could be going quite high. I mean, last year before his injury, he was what an eighth or ninth round pick in twelve team leagues. Um, you know, Jamison Williams, rookie receivers are always highly coveted. He was probably uh, the highest graded uh, prospect coming into the into the draft, and you know, he fell a little bit, not too much, but he fell a little bit because of his injury. Um, but had he not been injured, he probably would have been the top receiver in this draft. And so these guys may have value this year. So pick them up and always try to keep your IR spots full. If you have one, two, three, doesn't matter. Try to keep it full. And when it comes time to activate them, you can deal with that later on in the season. Now, my next tip is kind of two tips combined into one. And, it, and it's about the kicker position. And if your league still has kickers, I, I recommend for you to not overvalue kickers and also to kind of use kickers as an extra roster spot on your team. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a bit. Now, for the first part of that tip, don't overvalue kickers when it comes to the draft. Every year, if you look at ADP, you look at average draft position, a kicker, the number one kicker who people think is going to be the top kicker in the league, always goes somewhere in the 12th. Uh, to the early 13th round. And I'm telling you, don't be that person. Yes, Justin Tucker is probably the best kicker in the NFL, but that doesn't mean he's going to be the top fantasy scorer at the kicker position. In fact, the last time that the number one overall kicker, the consensus number one according to ADP, actually finished as the number one fantasy kicker that year was in 2015. So that means since 2016, the number one, the first kicker taken in most drafts has not finished as the best kicker in that season. And if you take a look at this image, you can see every year since 2016, the first kicker that was taken on average in most drafts, uh, where they were taken on average in most drafts versus where they finished. And you can see that not only has no kicker that has been taken number one on average, uh, finished as the first overall kicker, but they've only finished in the top three once, and that was in 2021 with Justin Tucker. So we have a 10th place, 4th place, 12th, 10th, 7th place finish for the kicker, the consensus number one overall kicker. And those numbers kind of work out that way, mostly because it's just too hard to predict kickers and how they're going to translate to fantasy success. Uh, you, there's no one thing to look at to say this is who the top kicker is going to be, like there are maybe with other positions. Uh, if you look in 2020, Jason Saunders was the top fantasy kicker that year. Um, and the Miami Dolphins, the team that he kicked for, they finished, I think, 15th overall in offensive scoring that year in, in points per game. So you can't even say, well, uh, the best kicker is going to come from the top scoring team because that's just not always the case. Now, another really important factor that plays into not overvaluing kickers is understanding that there's really only one, maybe two kickers every year that actually make a difference scoring-wise. As you can see from this image in uh, 2021, that Nick Folk was the only kicker who averaged double-digit points a game. And between kicker two, uh, Evan McPherson, and kicker 10, Dustin Hopkins, there was only about a point per game average that was differentiating. And we see a similar thing in 2020. Actually, we have um, more like two kickers, Jason Sanders and Young Wei Hu, uh, who were kind of the difference makers at the kicker position. And then from, from three to 12, you know, you don't have a huge, or three to 10, you don't have a huge differentiation between kicker three and, and kicker 10. And basically what this means is that you can kind of get away with just playing the matchup game and, and streaming kickers, whoever has the best matchup for that week. And finally, the last thing that's in favor of the don't overvalue kickers tip is just look at the type of players that you could possibly get at where the first kicker's being taken late in the 12th, early 13th round. And this is for 12-team leagues, of course. But you're looking at players like Michael Carter, Michael Gallup, Sky Moore, Brian Robinson, Alexander Madison, Isaiah Spiller, Isaiah Pacheco. These are guys that you can get instead of drafting that first kicker. These guys can make a huge difference. These guys can be the difference between winning a championship and losing. A lot of guys can break out 
that are drafted in the late round. So I urge you, don't overvalue the kickers. So now that we know some of those stats about the difference makers at the kicker position and how little there are, it kind of uh, sheds some light on the second part of this tip, which is use the kicker position as an extra roster spot. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is how I treat the kicker is, first of all, I don't draft one. I take, like I said previously in this video, one of those IR guys that I can throw in my IR, and then I can pick up a kicker. Or I just take an extra running back, a receiver, or quarterback, or tight end, and hold on to them up until the point of when I need a kicker. Nothing's really going to change at the kicker position. Guys aren't going to get cut. Guys probably aren't going to get hurt between now and the start of the NFL season, right? There's only one kicker on each team. You kind of know who they are at this point. So why not, if you, let's say you draft this weekend, why not grab an extra running back or receiver and wait, wait to pick up your kicker. See what happens. There's still a lot that can happen between now and the NFL season in terms of injuries, especially. Let's say, for example, you pick up Matt Breda in the last round of your, of your fantasy drafts instead of drafting a kicker. And then for some reason, unfortunately, Saquon Barkley gets hurt or Saquon Barkley is going to miss a couple the first couple games of the season. Now, because you didn't draft a kicker, you have the starting running back for the Giants. That could happen. It's very possible. So don't draft a kicker. Wait until you actually need one and then drop whoever you need to drop and pick them up. Now, it goes even beyond that with treating it like an extra position player. Now, if you don't have one of those, the, the first or second rated kicker or highest fantasy kicker, you know, if you don't have one of the true difference makers, which you probably won't, but if you do, you'll hold on to them. But if you don't, what how I play with the kicker position and make it more strategic is every Monday or Tuesday, I drop my kicker, whoever it is. I drop them in, pre in preparation for the waiver wire. And now I, I can pick up a running back or wide receiver or tight end or quarterback, and I can add them on my roster, a guy that maybe I want to keep on my team, and I can hold on to him for the entire week until Sunday morning when you know I need to pick up my kicker. Then I'll figure out who I want to drop, and I'll drop him. But I can pick up a, an extra position player, a non-kicker, and I can hold on to him, and I can see what happens. What if someone gets hurt again? What if someone's going to be out this week? You know, things can happen. It's the NFL. So that's how I play with the kicker position. Also, what it does is you can kind of keep other players, you know, potential breakout players that you want to keep on your team. You can keep them from other people. So you hold on to them until Sunday morning and then you drop them and they become locked. For most standard leagues, they become locked and they cannot be picked up for 24 hours. But by that time, they're already going to play their game, so they cannot be picked up for that week. It's just another little strategic move that you can use. Use the kicker as an extra roster spot. We just talked about how from kickers 3 through 10, there's really not, not much of a difference. You can kind of pick up a kicker uh, based on their matchup, or maybe you can pick up the kicker that you dropped early in the week. Most people aren't going to be dropping their kickers and picking up new ones. So use it as an extra roster spot. Hold on to an extra skill position player. Hold on to a running back that maybe you want to keep on your team that you have interest in picking up because who knows what will happen. And that player can turn into a starter and it can help you win your leagues. And that brings us to our last tip. And that is about defense slash special teams. And the tip is to don't overvalue defenses, but also don't undervalue defenses at the exact same time. Now, what do I mean about not overvaluing defenses? Well, it's when it comes to the draft. Again, just like with kickers, don't overdraft what you think will be the top defenses. Just take a look at this image here, and we can see that since 2014, only once has the consensus number one overall def defense actually finished as the top scoring fantasy defense in that year. All other years, they fell out of the top three, and look at it, since 2017, the consensus number one defense finished tied for 18th, 15th, 18th, 20th, 16th. These are unusable defenses, and look at the draft capital that you have to use to get them a late eighth-round pick to a mid to late 
ninth round pick if you want what you think will be the number one defense. Defenses are just too hard to predict. And if you look on the flip side, where the top fantasy scoring defenses from those years actually were taken, they were taken near the end of the draft, and some of them weren't even drafted at all. They were all taken in the 13th, 14th round or undrafted. And just like with kickers, defenses, there's only very few that are actual difference makers. There's one or two every year that score very highly and are consistent most weeks, but that's it. All the others, they're very similar to each other. Defenses three through 12 are very, very similar and they all have their bad and they're good weeks. Most defenses, save for the top one or two, are really matchup dependent. And that's how you have to approach the defense position. It's based off of matchups. They're more matchup dependent than any other position in fantasy. Again, just look at the players you have to pass up if you want to try and figure out what that top defense is going to be. Guys like Chris Olave, Kenneth Gainwell, James Robinson, McKissick. These are league winners. These are guys who can win you your leagues. Now, with all that being just said, I don't want people to think that I think defenses... And... Now, with all of that that I just said, I don't want people to think that I think defenses are irrelevant or they should be treated like kickers dropped all the time because that is not true. Defenses can win you weeks, so don't undervalue them at the same time. Now, what I mean by that, in your drafts, we just talked about, maybe don't try and reach for that potential top defense, the consensus, most likely the Buffalo Bills this year, you know, or the Dallas Cowboys. Don't try to reach for those guys in the ninth round. Wait till the ends of your drafts. Find a defense that has a really nice opening schedule, first, for, first two or three games that you can use. And then every week you start analyzing defenses as it becomes a little more clear of what teams are good and what teams aren't good. You'll be able to find defenses that have good stretches against good against bad teams, right? For example, the Chargers this year, they have a good stretch between, I think, weeks four to, to six or seven where they, you know, they're playing uh, the Texans and maybe like Jacksonville during that time and a couple other weak teams. You can drop and you can pick them up and use them for a three, four week stretch and then find another defense that has another stretch. Defenses are all about matchups. Now, in order to do this, sometimes you have to plan ahead. Sometimes you have to pick up that team in week two, that defense in week two, because you know, starting in week three, they have a really easy schedule. But you're gonna be competing against a lot of people. If you're in a really good competitive league, you'll be competing against a lot of people trying to get that defense in week three. But not many of them are going to try to get that defense in week two. So if you have the roster spot, if you're able to hold on to uh, uh, two defenses, pick up the defenses a week earlier than when you need to. Again, defenses are important. They can win you leagues, but don't overvalue them in the draft because more often than not, the top defense that we all think is going to be the number one defense is probably not going to be the number one. And you're going to have to spend a high draft pick in order to get them. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope these tips have helped you and are going to help you this season and in future seasons. Uh, if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, tell me what you think about these tips. Tell me your own tips about what you use during your fantasy drafts or during the fantasy season that, you know, are kind of on that next level. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I'll be back soon with some more fantasy content, of course. And until next time.